Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We will call this work session to order. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, public comment, clerk, is, is there anyone here for public comment? Yes, ma'am, we have three. Okay, we have three citizens. We respect our citizens' right to address their government in this meeting. However, I, I intend to enforce the three-minute rule this morning in order for this meeting to run effectively and efficiently. Once reached, you will be allowed to finish your sentence, and then I'll take the floor back. Please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against personnel or officials, which should be handled in another forum uh, other than this body. The first citizen today is Mr. Larry Pierce. Hi, Mr. Pierce. Good morning. Good Please morning. come forth and restate your address and give us your subject matter. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what. My name is Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Yes, sir. And I'm going to try to stay on your good side after that meeting last week. So I'd like to read something here that Miss Jones, chair lady, put out. It says here, well, I've got to get my magnifiers on. Most importantly, I will stand for what is right, do what is right, and stand up for all the citizens of Douglas County. I like that. And the first thing I want to remind you about is again the law, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, like I said before, the legislature don't write this for their health, but on the 4516-6, about training of coroners mm -hmm. and deputies, okay? It says one word here, the sentence, take in the course, and it is to be given once a year by the Georgia Coroners Training Council. In this case, the councils are spread around Georgia that makes it easy among the 150 some counties. And here's a printout from the Georgia one in Forsyth County. Probably seven or eight times a year that the coroners can go there, okay? Now, having said that, I'm gonna say again that I know it's not your job to investigate. But I think we ought to bring it to your attention that Mr. Teal and Ms. Chairman are hoodwinked into signing documents that allow people to go to expensive conferences. Now, as much as I've been investigating this, I asked back for it because I didn't have all the facts two weeks ago. And here's the facts. The facts are that you go to Forsyth County for training, okay? Mm -hmm. You got to, law said so right here. But you see this right here, this one right here? She was registered to go to Jekyll Island. Did, didn't have to go, but two weeks ago I said she did go. But I'm retracting that because I found out she didn't have to go, okay? Could have gone to Forsyth County. And when she found out she was gonna be registered on the Bay side, no, I want an ocean view. This here was registered $170 a day per deal with everything included, meals and all. Meals and all. No. She went to the West End Mr. on the ocean side Mr. for $220 a day. Mr. Pierce, your three minutes. Your three minutes have exceeded, sir. You know, it's going to take another three minutes to tell you about this other hotel. Mr. But I'm not quitting. And it's time that you start looking exactly for what the fact is. Yes, sir. Okay? All right. Thank you, Mr. Pierce, for taking this matter on the advisement. Next, we have Mr. Roy Sparks. Oh, there he is. Roy Sparks, 5275 Driscoll Drive, Winston, Georgia. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Commissioners and all others. I want to speak to you about economic development. I am for real economic development. 
with real companies coming to town that want to pull their weight, not throw their weight. You know, if they played the Super Bowl by the economic game rules of Douglas County, there wouldn't be a Super Bowl. You have commentators telling us what we're winning, but nobody's really keeping score. When we do these programs, what are we getting? What are we giving away? What are we receiving? Nobody really keeps up with that. Some time ago, you had a project come before you that's coming back again. And what amazes me, you've done no financial risk analysts on these projects coming before you today, but Fox Hall that came up in 2014, there's been two studies done. And if you read both of the studies that the county paid for, independent of the development authority, if you read those reports, they tell you of all the dangers of this project, both plans, one and plan two. And plan two pretty much spells out failure. But nobody adhered to that. <coughs> Madam Chair, that was before your time, but three commissioners are here today that voted for that. One voted against it. And it just amazes me, just like with this project, they can't get their funding. The project is not going forward. And I ask that when it comes back before this board, do another analyst of it and adhere to what they tell you to li listen to what you tell them. You pay them to tell you listen to it because it wasn't listened to before. And just like you have a commentator that gets up here and tells you about all your winnings with these projects, yet Fox Hall has never happened. I was at the meeting when they brought Fox Hall to the table. The commentator said, all of you in Douglas County that live here and live in a home less than $250,000, you are a drain on this county. That's the reason we need the Fox Halls in this community. Well, I got news for you. I don't think people are a drain on the county that live in less than a $250,000 home. They are hardworking taxpayers. And just like with the bus system that we've got before us. There's no feasibility study been done to see if this project is viable in the future. It's, it's touted as a component of economic development. If you don't know if it's feasible, it could be a component of economic downfall. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Starks. We will take this matter under advisement. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Mrs. Don, Don Leonard. Please see your address and your subject matter this morning is buses. Yes, Dawn Leonard, uh, Creekside Subdivision in District 2. Uh, after our citizens meeting on Monday night, uh, I have an observation here. I did a little more digging and I, I just want something clarified. Uh, the supplement to the CMAC grant was submitted to the ARC on October 13th. The Trans Transportation Committee, uh, Gary Watson, presented it, put it out on the table, as he said, uh, to the Transportation Committee on the 16th of October. Now, they're not a voting body, and that's not okay. The Board of Commissioners did not vote on that supplement, and I would like this clarified. Okay, thank you so much for the, um, we'll take this down under advisement, but the date I just want to stand to be corrected is October 10th on that transportation committee. Okay. And our commissioner guided this time. It, it, it was, was October 16th. 16th. Board right. after it was already submitted. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Next, moving forward, we have the approval of the minutes. I uh, encourage you commissioners to please take a look at the, at the minutes and we will go from there tomorrow, we will approve those minutes. Proclamations, we have one proclamation um, on our agenda for tomorrow, proclaiming the month of February Arts, Culture, and Humanities Month in Douglas County. And uh, that will be presented by Miss Lisa Doney. Dooney. Um, is she here today? She's not. Oh, she's okay. So we will have that uh, proclamation being read and uh, the board commissioners will 
uh, approved tomorrow. Public hearing. We have a pu public hearing on today's agenda. And that public hearing is tab number five, considering uh, issuing a new liquor license and the transfer of beer, wine, and liquor license for the purpose of our own premise consumption. And that will be, uh, that uh, public hearing will be led by Mr. James Worthen, our Director of uh, Development. Um, do you have any comments? Uh, no, ma'am. Just, they've submitted all the uh, required documentation. They've met all the requirements on our end, and it's, it's up to the board. Okay. All right. Next, we have resolutions. We have one resolution, or we have more than one. We have um, our tab number six is a resolution. We have a resolution to approve SuperNAP Atlanta LLC's participation in the Douglas County Tax Savings Incentive Plan and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. This will be presented by uh, Executive Director of Economic Development, Mr. Chris, Chris Pumphrey. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Great, Chris. Good. Glad to be here in front of you. Um, it's been a minute since we've been here in front of you. Um, Happy New Year. So. <laughs> Happy February. Um, here to uh, present uh, this project uh, before you. Um, it's uh, <coughs> under the former code name of Project Hoover. Um, it was a fish formally announced last year, and we are finally um, presenting before you um, the property tax um, incentive plan for the project. Um, just just a little background so you, you all know everyone's on the same page. We did complete a, a community and economic development strategic plan uh, last year. I believe there was a piece in the Sentinel on it. Um, in last week's um, uh, edition where we laid out kind of what the plan was all about, laid out what our target sectors were uh, for the community, and really kind of uh, laying out a different path uh, for Douglas County. Um, as, as you all know, we've seen significant amount of growth that's happened on the, in the industrial sector. Um, a lot of that on the warehouse and distribution side. Um, a lot of um, conflict arose over the last several years, which is why we moved towards the implementation of the Sweetwater Master Plan. And laying out that Sweetwater Master Plan so we could find some balance between commercial, industrial, and residential growth um, over there uh, in, that, in that area. Um, it also is the area where we have seen a lot of uh, the, the, the growth to start to take place on the data center side. Um, and that is, that sector falls within our target clusters, our target sectors that we want to recruit uh, to our community because they have significant benefits um, to our community. Um, for, for one, um, whereas one argument is that they do not, they don't bring a whole lot of jobs, but they do bring, they do bring jobs and they do bring higher paying jobs uh, to our community. Uh, on average. In Douglas County, our overall county average wage is right about $17 an hour. And so these jobs are paying um, at, at least $8 an hour above, above that here in our community. So they're, they're not bringing as many jobs as a large manufacturer, but they're bringing higher, higher paying jobs. And as you start to cluster in those sectors, you start to bring about more services and, and amenities that serve that, that higher wage earning clientele. Um, a number of years ago, we did have the location of Google in our community, and that proved to be a huge catalyst for us because it fortified and, and gave confidence to the market that we had the infrastructure to support successful data centers here. So we've had significant growth in fiber. Um, our power companies have made significant investments um, in their redundant power infrastructure, and so we have a number of data, um, power substations that are serving um, the area, the fiber in the ground. We've got the water and sewer infrastructure that's necessary to support it. Uh, the land sites that allow companies to do campuses uh, in our community. And, and so we, we've got the right mix that, that's starting to happen here in our community. And so uh, we want to see that sector to continue to grow. One of the other benefits that these data centers um, bring to the table is that they're huge consumers of power. And by being huge consumers of power, um, there's a, a significant tax um, benefit that comes from that as well because there's sales tax uh, that is on the energy that is consumed at these facilities as well. Um, so we've, um, we, we've worked very hard in, in working with these companies and, and highlighting all of these benefits um, here in our community. And so um, as you all uh, know, uh, SWITCH um, was announced by Governor Deal's office um, last year, um, that which you have before you is the SuperNAP Atlanta LLC, which would be the uh, official name of this, this division or unit 
of switching. And Rob, you can correct how I, what that exactly is. Um, but um, but SuperNAP Atlanta will be the, the facility here uh, in Douglas County. The operation will be located uh, right on the east side of the county, just north of Google. Uh, the goal there is that it'll be a million square feet um, uh, under roof uh, once the project is completed with roughly 105 jobs um, uh, at the location uh, paying about $25 an hour. <clears throat> so um, on, on the project, what we have laid, the, the property that was chosen, um, 65 acres which actually grew to a little bit around 80 acres. Um, just to give you some perspective, uh, last year, paid roughly $30,000 um, in property taxes um, in, in the community. That's just raw land uh, that was generating $30,000, and that $30,000 um, going to split between the school system and Douglas County. Um, this investment um, on the switch side uh, of it is $702 million. Uh, that will go into uh, the, the, the facilities that are being constructed, and those will have significant tax um, benefits. So what I want to do is I'm going to come back to you and talk a little bit more about the incentive. But we do have Rob Elliott here uh, with the company. Um, Rob is actually relocated uh, from Las Vegas uh, to, uh, to the Atlanta area and will be the, our, our main person kind of responsible for this facility. Um, and so I want to have Rob to come up and talk a little bit more about the company. And then I'll come back and answer any, uh, just lay out the incentive and answer any questions about it. Does that sound good? Perfect. Rob. Rob, before you start, I, uh, this is the largest investment in Georgia's history, not Douglas County. So I will ask my directors to please stand and clap. I just really appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> please. Wow, that's, I'm humbled by that. I'll tell you. I'm going to report that right back to our, our founder and chairman, Rob Roy. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's Rob Elliott, uh, Senior Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for SWITCH. My address, for the record, is 1080 Peachtree. I'm very proud to be at a Peachtree address um, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I moved here about six weeks ago, and I keep hearing that it's not always as cold here. So I'm going to hold you all to that. <laughs> it's not going to be like that. But it's been a great experience. And um, one, we're so excited by what you all have done here in Douglas County. You truly, with the work that you're doing, are creating the physical infrastructure that is going to power the growth of the internet of absolutely everything. And Douglas County is the epicenter for that. And that is a critical decision for us uh, to be here at SWITCH. Um, all right, as, as the, the chairwoman mentioned, you know, this, this is a $2.5 billion investment um, here in the state of Georgia, and it will build out, as Chris mentioned, we will be the largest data center campus in the southeast. It's a strategic part of SWITCH's growth. We have only four campuses in the United States of America. We have one in Las Vegas, which is currently the largest data center campus on planet Earth, at over 2 million square feet there, and it continues to grow. <coughs> Um, we expanded into the northern part of the state, about 550 miles uh, to Reno, and that, will, uh, that campus will end up being a, a massive campus in the northern part of the state with a lot of attraction for companies out of Silicon Valley and throughout the Pacific Northwest. We're in Grand Rapids, Michigan to service that part of the, of the United States, and this is our key strategic location here. And to the point of uh, a job creation, you know, we expect that uh, we'll, we'll employ thousands of construction workers on this campus as it builds out. As a, for instance, in Las Vegas, we've been in nonstop construction building that campus uh, for over 10 years. Through the recession, we had people at work doing construction because the thing about uh, even economic bad times, people don't stop posting pictures, they don't stop playing games online, and they don't stop doing those things that we use the internet for. It continues to grow, and it's just going to grow exponentially now. So we know that we're going to have a strong local workforce that is going to be building our data centers. That's a commitment from our CEO that we must hire local people um, to work uh, on our construction and also within our data centers. Chris mentioned the job creation number. We think that might be a little conservative as we continue to grow, but that's, that's the number we're happy to, to provide to the county. Again, we will be hiring people from the local community unless there's a specific expertise that we need um, to work in that data center. Uh, one, one of the pleasures that we've had as we've, we've uh, continued to grow um, is about 70% of our workforce is veterans, former military. Um, so they're, and the reason why there's such a great fit for our industry is that we truly operate in a mission critical environment. You cannot have 
you cannot have our buildings go down. You can't have downtime there. The internet shuts down. That's not a good day for anybody when that happens. And we have over 800 different clients who really rely on us providing 100% uptime, which is why we are the highest rated data, co-location data centers in the world. And that's what we're bringing here. So we will work actively to recruit people who have had that military service. Our security force is proprietary. They're all former law enforcement or active military as well. Those are the types of people that we want to have working in our data center to ensure it's mission critical, running like a mission tight ship every single day. Um, and we also will get very active uh, with the local community and workforce development. You know, one of the challenges we all face is where do we find the workforce that's going to fill those jobs for tomorrow? And at, in Las Vegas, we actually partnered with our local community colleges, the two-year schools, um, to help them craft curriculum that would enable someone to work in a mission critical HVAC. You, you work in HVAC in a home, it's a lot different than working in HVAC with multi-mode air conditioning, things like that, and 100% uptime in a data center. So we work with them to craft curriculum that actually will prepare someone to work in either HVAC, electrical, or networking in a data center environment that then go into an internship and to work at Switch. So that's something that we're very excited to start working on. And part of the reason why I'm here is that I want to take as much time and, and have every opportunity to network and work with uh, all the local colleges so that we can figure out the best ways to make that happen. But at the end of the day, I gotta tell you that that, that warm, warm welcome is exactly, you know, I've heard about this thing called Southern Hospitality and it's real. And uh, yeah, I will, I will uh, I'm very happy to be here, very happy to be in switch employee number one here on the ground. If there's ever any questions or anything that uh, you have an idea about or you think that Switch might need to know about and get involved with, happy to do that because that, we're here in Georgia, we are part of this community, and we are a company that gets very, very involved in the community, in community relations, and economic development, and education. Those are things that are our passions and want to bring that here. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, that was great. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, uh, the property that um, for, for this project uh, last year um, had a tax, uh, tax bill of roughly $30,000 that includes the additional property that was tied, uh, tied onto this facility. Um, as Rob mentioned, we have a two and a half billion dollar um, investment and just like on the job side, that's probably a conservative number as well uh, all, over the time period. The incentive that you have um, before you is part of our already pre-approved plan um, that, that was approved back in uh, 2013. Um, the plan is based on the, the, the investment um, by switch and based on the jobs created by switch. Um, and I want to make sure that that's very clearly understood um, that it's solely on the switch investment and job creation. So if you take the two and a half billion and that is a total investment which includes the servers um, that are invested by the clients and the, the investment uh, made by Switch. So that investment made by Switch is $702 million of the $2.5 billion. What that means for, for the purposes of our approval is that the, re the latter of that investment, or the, I would say the greater of that investment, is invested by their clients into their servers. So the facilities are constructed um, and, and made fit so that their clients can plop in their servers. When the clients invest in their servers, it's a continual investment. So those servers are invested in year one, and then in year three, year four, or what have you, they are then replaced, reinvested. And so there is a continual investment into, into the community. What that further means, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the incentive is only on the switch side, is that investment is 100% taxed. So that is 100% property tax that will be uh, generated and, and goes into the Douglas County Schools and Douglas County Government Tax Digest. Um, so um, that number, top of my head, is roughly 18 million, if I'm not 18, eight, something, you know my math, but um, <laughs> um, two and a half billion less 702 million, whatever that number is, <laughs> um, is, is the number that is, con is constantly invested into um, and, and goes into the tax digest. The tax incentive plan, uh, which you have before you, is broken down into three phases. So phase one is for building one, uh, the building one investment uh, and the land investment, and that is a 10-year tax plan. 
Um, when building two is constructed, it will be a 10 year tax plan for building two. When building three is constructed, it's a 10 year tax plan for building three. So we haven't changed our, our plan in any way. They are separate individual tax plans for each of the facilities. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, um, so there, there are three separate tax plans for each of the facilities. Um, we worked uh, closely with the tax assessor's office to try and get a good idea of what that number will be. It's kind of impossible to, to predict what it's gonna be. You never know what the millage rate will be in a particular year. Um, you don't know what the valuations will be in properties around it and what, what may change in this valuation. But what, you would, what we're looking at just based on today's millage rate just for that building one over the 10 year period, it would be about $3 million in property taxes that are paid um, on the real property um, by, by switch. And then that is in addition to um, the personal property that will be invested. Um, we did run some, um, uh, there was, we did have an economic impact model uh, that was run. Um, as you may have seen the article that was in, the, in yesterday's Sentinel. Um, we just kind of look at it at stabilization, assuming all of the buildings are up, kind of roughly a figure of, of $7.9 million on an annual basis would be paid on the property taxes from those servers uh, in, into, into um, the digest. Once again, that's 100% um, of that on at today's millage rate going into this camp, the schools and the, the tax digest. So you take a property um, that was uh, generating roughly $30,000 a year in property taxes, and these are the numbers that are the result uh, of, of that, the investments being made um, and the decision by switch for coming to the community. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners, Vice Chairman Robinson? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll use a segue. Um, <clears throat> the comment, with public comment made earlier about um, the importance to look at this. Um, uh, going back to um, our previous policy discussions, and I remember that so well. Um, when, when, you know, I voted against that 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 deal. Not that I was against economic development, but it is all about the terms. It's always about structure, and we drive home that point today. So that being said, let me ask you a question. At ramp up, when do you think that all three of these buildings will be up? My first question. I would defer to Rob on that one. I, I couldn't guess, and I'm not sure. Just roughly. I mean, I know we're not trying to box. We're trying to get a relative understanding of when we can expect, you know, the, um, the numeric yield back. So, can you might give me that roughly? Yeah, if you want, I, I'd rather. <laughs> I mean, we project we're going to be open uh, first. Oh, sorry. You don't mind. <laughs> Thank you again, Rob Elliott, for the record. Um, we project that we're going to be opening up the first building uh, in the first quarter of next year. So that's the first ramp up that uh, we can outline for you right now. So it's, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we're, we're, already, we're already at it. So <laughs> and, and my second question is that you're committed to Douglas County. Um, do we expect, I mean, based on the growth that you're saying, and, and by all means, for the record, I had the opportunity to go out and look at the Las Vegas. Um, it, it was a fortress. It, it was huge. Do we anticipate that type of presence here, and do you see expansion opportunities? That's my second question. To answer your first question, the name of the campus is the Keep Campus, and the Keep is a fortified structure within the castle, so it's kind of a fun name. Uh, but it is literally data fortress. Um, if you've been to Las Vegas or to our campus in Tahoe, Reno, they, they're certain they're heavily uh, their level of security is very intense. They're intended to be you know, an intimidating presence because we think that the first level in any sort of data security is physical security. So uh, we had a rendering. Unfortunately, we didn't we didn't get it up, but uh, we can show you exactly what that looks like. It have a very large massive wall around it, um, but a nice looking wall, which is kind of cool too. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we see this as you know, our, our first introduction into, uh, into the market. And uh, you know, the, the one, one thing we know, and I think everybody in this room knows, you know, we all have connected devices you know, in our lives that are running everything that we do. Uh, we can, you know, our homes are run, our thermostats are run, our dishwashers, our refrigerators, you name it. Everything is through a connected device as we get into autonomous systems and all those different uh, vehicles are going to be on the road. The amount of data that's going to be generated is just going to continue to grow massively and exponentially. And I think that's why this 
particular area is so attractive because there's such a solid infrastructure to support that growth of, again, I said that internet of absolutely everything because that is where the world is headed and where all of our lives are headed. So yeah, this is, uh, you know, I, I've been in Las, I've, I've been with Switch for a couple of years. I've been in Las Vegas uh, most of my life. And when I got to the company, we, uh, you know, we finished, we finished building out Las Vegas uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. We opened Tahoe Reno, we opened Grand Rapids, and we announced Atlanta. So that can give you a sense of the speed and the, uh, which uh, data and data storage is growing. That, that is sufficient. I'll have my last question. I'll give it to my colleagues. Um, this goes to Chris Pumphrey. Chris, um, going back to um, our, in, our economic development, instead of planning policy that we created three or four years ago, and you alluded to that this is um, an incentive plan for each building, mm -hmm. which gets around um, the neighbors, which was we refinanced their incentive plan from one building to the next. Clarify that, that this, these are distinct and separate. And we are compliant with the policy that we put in place three years ago, just for the record. Yes, sir. Um, that, that is precisely right. Um, that is, we, in order to extend the tax plan, we would have had to have changed the ordinance. And we did not, we did not warrant any change to the ordinance because the ordinance states that the, the plans are five or ten years. Uh, and so this is within that, that, that structure. And like we mentioned, you know, when building one starts, once it gets to year 10, building one rolls off. And when building two starts, once it gets to year 10, then building two rolls off. And so there are three, as you mentioned, three distinct um, tax incentive plans. Very good. I yield, Madam Chair. Okay. Commissioner Dider. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Chris, uh, when I was at the Development Authority and y'all were going over this, you mentioned a bill at the legislature um, uh, governing the sales tax on personal property, mm -hmm. the servers and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you, you're saying that uh, the servers will be taxable and everything, but if that bill doesn't pass, what would prevent the clients who are going to be leasing the buildings from coming up here and asking for an abatement? Can you explain the, the, the bill? that is down at the legislature right now. Yeah, I, I, can, um, I, I can give kind of the, the, the general idea about the bill, and Rob probably knows this like 10 times more than me. Um, but in, in essence, um, there is a sales and use tax exemption for the acquisition of computer equipment. Um, today, however, that, that bill does not apply to co-location data centers, which is what SWITCH is. It applies to enterprise data centers, which is um, an example of a Google where they own the facility, own the equipment. But for the co-locations, it does not. <coughs> and so the bill that is working its way through um, today basically allow, makes that allowance for the co-locations as long as they meet certain standards, um, a high, high, they're basically high standards in order to qualify uh, for, for that sales tax exemption. Um, and if once that exemption is passed and, and is in place, then it, it prevents them from, um, by law, it prevents them from getting a property tax exemption on the, the servers um, in the facility. Oh, that, what if it doesn't right? pass? And they don't get that exemption, so are they open to coming to the local uh, government and asking for an abatement? So I would say based on our, based on what we have, anybody who meets the, the, per, the parameters of the plan, they qualify. The, the, the general issue with that is that, as I described earlier, the constant reinvestment of, uh, of the servers, it's a lot of <coughs> legwork for the companies. Um, and so a little bit of background, we also approved in the city limits Cyrus One. Um, Cyrus One is a co-location data center facility that located in the city of Douglasville. And they're under the same, uh, a, a similar plan in essence to where the plan is approved on the real property, the investment by Cyrus One, and their clients um, are, are not a part of, of that plan. They opted not to. Well, well, I'll, well personal property. I, I guess I get a, a little bit more background is um, they opt not to, yes. However, it's more, 
is a lot more work for them to apply for for the plans, and so it's just easier to just pay the make the investment and pay the tax. Um, so, but technically, um, you can present, but it, the likelihood is, is pr pretty low. Um, I noticed in the uh, copy that I have it that it mentions pilot money, uh, but I didn't have the attachment. It said it referred to a memo. Um, that wasn't attached to what I was given at the development authority. So, so just to, how is the pilot money going to be calculated? Yeah, is there a so certain I think, dollar amount? I, I want to make just make sure. I, I think we got some confusion um, in in what pilot really is. So you can have a, in lieu of taxes. Exactly. And <laughs> every every company on a property tax incentive plan is on a pilot program. Every company. It's just that what we've gotten associated with pilot is a fixed payment um, uh, for, for plans, and we've kind of defined that as our pilot. But every company, um, whether it's Medline, um, Cyrus One, SuperNAP, um, um, any company that's on a property tax incentive plan is, is making payments in lieu of taxes. The reason being is that the development authority holds title to the property, and so they make payments kind of at a discounted rate equivalent to what the taxes would be. But it's not a tax payment because we, the property is in essence exempt from taxes. So that's why it's called a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes. They're just making those payments. I'm just asking how, how much is it going to be? Do y'all have yeah, well that, like well that's, Google, I know they pay. They, they, made a fixed, they made a fixed payment. And so what I was referencing earlier. This is not a fixed payment. It's not a fixed payment, payment correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's the, the plan, and it should be in your, um, I think it's the page before that. Um, you see the actual schedule, um, the schedule of the plan. And so they make the payments based on those percentages. And so as I mentioned earlier, building one would generate um, in those payments in lieu of taxes would generate uh, almost $3 million over the 10 years based on today's millage rate and assumed valuations of the property. But they're not going to be paying any, um, what I, pilots to me is the payments in lieu of taxes. They're going to be exempt for <coughs> four, year, four or five years on their property. And like Google, they paid money uh, as a, yeah, they, they made a just fixed, the yeah, yeah, they just made payments to the payment, county yeah. uh, and the schools mm -hmm. uh, because they were exempt for those years. And that's the way I read this, and I may be mistaken, yeah, but yeah. I thought that. That's yeah, no, my it's not. Yeah, not only the same. This is, of pilot. Yeah, it's, they're, they're all pilots. They just all come in different forms. But this is a pilot based on those schedules. So as you see there, um, when you see the 10%, um, if, well, if that's it, just a schedule to me. But anyway, we, we'll move on. Uh, so they're not going to be making pilot money like Google. Correct. Right? They'll be making they'll be making payments based on the percentages you see in the schedule. Here. Okay, and uh, you know the the federal government's been talking about a lot of infrastructure that's going in and the internet bringing the internet to rural areas and everything. Mm -hmm. Is this or is Switch going to be a player in this project? <laughs> I, I don't know exactly what you're referencing there, but um, everything is basically operating now. It's like the, the Internet of Things now. I mean, as Rob mentioned, as, as but it was in the State of the Union mm -hmm. address the other night, and he was talking about bring, bringing uh, Internet to the rural areas because oh, a lot yeah, of places yeah. They, yeah. they don't have access. And yeah. I just wondered if this was going to be. Um, Part of that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I guess that's it. Thank you. I yield back. <laughs> Commissioner Mulk here. Yes, uh, I'll bring up a, re a recurring theme. Anytime we hear about a, a project that's internal to the county or peripheral to the county or completely independent of the county, we talk about jobs and the opportunities for local contractors and so forth. We don't live in a type of government or type of country uh, where we can dictate that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, speaking in terms of community and so forth, uh, I would just like to say uh, that I would like to see a very uh, active uh, strategy to sure. hire as, as many uh, local contractors as, as possible. Mm -hmm. 
You know, con con construction jobs are one thing to be very migratory and obviously temporary. Uh, and then you have the staffing jobs, which is a completely different category. Uh, but I would just like to see a, a, a commitment, a head nod or whatever, that y'all will do what, what you can to see that most jobs are uh, leveraged against the local con uh, construction uh, companies, uh, large and small. Having said that, and this is a, a conversation for later that maybe the commission would uh, would like to have with the development authority, is is how can we we can't require companies to do that to, to hire local, but uh, I think we can legally incentivize that. Maybe it's in, in terms of percentages and you know and and and, uh, and so forth. So uh, later on, some some point in time, I'd like to see if there's some way we can actually. Uh, incentivize uh, local local hiring on these very large projects. Mm -hmm. So I, I yield back. Okay. Commissioner uh, Mitchell. And, and Chris, uh, mm -hmm. don't don't we do that somewhat? Incentivize companies to hire the black like, yeah. civilians. Yeah, I think he's talking on a different scale. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that yeah. Um, on the employment mm -hmm. side, yeah, we have that. Right. But not uh, the contract contractors. Right. Well, I got you. I got you. But but okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so so. Uh, I guess my only question would be, though, um, what's that timeline, I guess, getting the building up? Mm -hmm. um, and what are you looking for as far as that, that, uh, that program type guy? Are you looking for a high IT, IT guy? Or is it, what, what's the data center we're looking for as, uh, as staff, I guess I should mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. I know you're going to get with the, with the colleges and all these other guys and kind of build that whole program behind it, which I think is really great. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is what is that kind of not only timeline, but what are you actually looking for? So just just for the general public. Sure. Thank you again, Rob Elliott, for the record, um, and thanks for uh, putting the exclamation point on hiring local. Uh, we are already hiring local contractors on the job. Um, that's really important for us. We have some uh, some development uh, uh, in, in on the land that's uh, we've hired local. Contractors for that, you know, any of the tree removal and the land preparation as local contractors. Uh, our CEO has a personal commitment, and actually, I can tell you honestly, I've seen him say certain contractors have to go if they don't hire locally. That's uh, it's a very high threshold for him um, on ensuring that we hire local workforces. So that that is very very important for us. Uh, the type of jobs that uh, that you talked about, I think it's all the things that you mentioned. You know. They, Mission critical HVAC because that is a big part of what we do. Like electrical work, IT infrastructure, all those different types of positions that go into creating the uh, the network of the ecosystem that drives all those servers. And then to to, to Chris's point, like I mentioned, switch you know our co-location facility. We have over 800 different clients, major clients. Uh, from the biggest of the big fortune uh, you know 50 companies all the way to small businesses nonprofits churches so we can we can serve them the needs of all those different types of, of industries but what we've seen is you know in in the in the campus around uh the las vegas uh, data center um our core campus you know, we have companies that have relocated complete customer service centers call centers they bring those relocate those jobs to las vegas and the best way for me to describe that to you is um, Switch has about 650, almost 700 employees that are Switch employees. Mm -hmm. Over 9,000 people have access to swipe a badge into our data centers. Mm -hmm. And of that, so that's the number of people who are coming in there and working on those, those servers and the equipment that's in the data center. And of those, about a third of them have Nevada driver's licenses. So they're the folks whose jobs exist because that data center campus and that ecosystem mm -hmm. is in Las Vegas. So it creates this economic well um, and I can provide you know several different examples of major companies whose brand you'd recognize who have relocated their businesses there. And then the other folks are the ones who you know we're talking to uh, the young the, the lady from uh, from the, one of the hotels here. You know they're the folks who fly in. The companies are flying them in. They're have, working on the servers, doing installations, doing the change out that Chris is talking about, which is hundreds of millions of dollars every few years. Um, and they're staying in hotels, they're eating at restaurants, um, and creating that kind of third level of economic activity. So that's kind of the whole economic well. So hopefully that answers your question on the types of positions, and then just kind of try to provide a little more uh, color on the uh, on what the jobs look like uh, that would be coming here. And, and you said earlier you hope to be up and hopefully running next First year. First quarter of next year. First yeah. quarter of mm -hmm. next year, and, yep. and that's brick and mortar people in the mm -hmm. whole nine? Yep. Okay. Yep. So. 
So I'm number one. So <laughs> <laughs> we're already at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, thanks. All right. Thank you. You I do yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Just want to make sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Board commissioners? Thank you so much. You, you up next. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Tab number seven, a resolution to approve T5 data centers LLC's participation in the Douglas County tax savings and Senate plan and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. <coughs> Director Humphrey. Yes, um, so thank, thank you again. Um, so I've kind of already talked about the whole spiel about data centers and the growth in the community, um, and we're continuing that um, as evidence here today um, with the, uh, the proposed T5 um, uh, investment in our community. Um, this, uh, this project T5 is an Atlanta-based uh, co-location data center um, uh, uh, company. Um, they uh, have a, a significant footprint uh, in, in Alpharetta and other parts of the country and are um, looking to further as the Atlanta market continues to grow with corporate relocations and you know maybe an HQ2 or what have you that the need and demand for, for data um, is continuing to increase um, uh, in, in our region. And so um, what we have before you, um, and I don't know if you've gotten, we had to make some changes uh, to, to that plan. So what we approved at our development authority uh, meeting on Wednesday um, was that the uh, company would uh, have uh, a minimum of 10 jobs on site paying $28.25 an hour and investing $60 million uh, into their real property. Well, we are, um, we've adjusted that to now the project is $100 million um, uh, for, for that investment. Um, it'll be done in two phases, um, but all uh, under one roof. Um, so we'll have a 130,000 uh, square foot uh, facility that is constructed um, over on Factory Shoals Road. Um, this, this, um, and that property is also up for rezoning uh, tomorrow evening as well. Um, but we have, um, uh, just to, to be clear, that the plan is pretty much the, the same format, whereas we have a 10 year um, plan on um, the real property. Um, in the real property improvements. Uh, and once again, the personal property invested by the clients is not um, computed within that plan. So that, is, once again, is investment 100% um, uh, tax, tax um, on top of the real property uh, investment uh, of, of the project. And so um, that is kind of the, the base of, of the T5. Uh, program and we have Jimmy Bailey here to come up and, and tell you a little bit more about the company and um, and be able to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. The floor is temporary been yielded to the vice chair. Well thanks. Um, I am uh, Jimmy Bailey, uh, one of the founders of uh, T5 Data Centers. Uh, we welcome Rob to the neighborhood. Um, it is, uh, I can help continue the conversation. Uh, we we uh, started T5 data centers 10 years ago, and we started right down the street in Atlanta. I'm, I'm homegrown, uh, a native Atlanta, I went to Georgia Tech, and uh, we started our company after we, we uh, rolled out of the Stallback company. We actually worked for Roger Stallback in the real estate world. And um, we saw what, what Rob and Switch and many others saw out in uh, the data center world was that the Internet of Things is driving uh, data center development. And it's not just here, it's, it's all over the world. We are expanding into Ireland and into Asia and into international markets because our clients want <coughs> us to be connected uh, everywhere. But, we're very excited about um, uh, Douglas County because we, we already have one data center in Alpharetta. It's been very successful. <coughs> it is, it's full. Uh, many of the things that, that Chris talks about uh, have, have already happened. We've got um, uh, tenants in our data center that range from a couple of servers uh, all the way up to, uh, to several megawatts of power. So we're, we're very excited. We tend to travel in packs, and, and we might not like to say that, but it's true uh, because of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about infrastructure, and, and these data centers like power, and they like transmission power, and then they also like fiber. The fiber can tend to come later, 
you asked about the, the internet, it's really more about fiber and, and connectivity uh, across the, the country and the world. Um, so uh, like our competitors, we, uh, we, we primarily hire veterans. Uh, we, like, we, we like Navy new guys. Because uh, and we've got a lot of them in our facility management division, and we like those guys because th th they had to do it and not mess up at all. And usually these data centers, um, it's human error that's going to have them go down. Uh, so we like we like somebody that's very process oriented, and, and our veterans and, and especially our Navy new guys really fit fit that bill. So um, I, I'm happy to answer any further questions about about data centers and, and what they bring to the community. It, it is true that it's not a distribution facility uh, that's going to bring uh, hundreds and hundreds of jobs, but the jobs are high tech. Our facility managers have to be trained in, in heavy, heavily in mechanical and electrical systems. So they're highly technical jobs that are high, higher paying jobs uh, that, that end up managing uh, these data centers on a 24 by 7 basis. Um, are you going to flip back to Madam Chair? Okay. Commissioner Geiger? Yes. Chris, um, <clears throat> going back to the pack here, <laughs> uh, Google started out with their incentive with how many jobs and then what they ended up with after their phase one. That's a good question. I wasn't here, so I really don't remember what they started it out was, with. It was very minimal. Yeah. Uh, like 35 jobs, and they went up to, I think, over 200 jobs. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're right now at about 350. They're about 350. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, just to clarify something, because my paperwork does say 60 million, mm -hmm. but it, it's now 100 million. We got one up that kind of crash because we don't have it. I, yeah. I did it this morning. We got the information up in the weekend because of some issues about the capacity for electrical service. Only for 10 megawatts in the same building. But is there a reason why it jumped from we last Wednesday to from 60 million up to 100 million? <laughs> yeah, joking. Can you go more into Shall I stay here? And we won't hold <coughs> the fact that you went to Georgia Tech. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Georgia didn't have an engineering school. They <laughs> <laughs> got a lot of friends there, too. They do have a football team, however. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the record. <laughs> 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 now we're seeing some homegrown stuff. <laughs> Over the weekend, we were having discussions with some of, well, actually, with his partner concerning future plans for expansion and trying to nail that down. And although it will be in the same building <coughs> footprint, it will go to 10 megawatts, which takes it to what was just mentioned, $100 million. That conversation happened on Friday. That's why you don't have the resolution. It applies <coughs> is exactly the same with respect to the proposed abatement and the schedule that you have before you. The only change is to the number. And what we suggested over the weekend was that in order to be sure concerning the total amount of the investments that we will fit within the, within the umbrella that's proposed for the tax plan, they go ahead and put in the anticipated development over the 10-year period. That's and what, what happened. And what is the estimated time of um, opening? Um, very similar time frame that, that you've heard, uh, which would be a, a, a commencement uh, later this year and then moving in later next year uh, for, the, for the first building. Mm -hmm. And, and as, as is typical with data centers, th there's a phase-in plan. So we're driven, we're driven by the, the tenants that are interested in coming to our facility. So, Usually what that phase one looks like is the initial building and then a portion of the critical megawatts uh, that we refer to. We, we usually refer to data centers in critical megawatts because we're not leasing square footage, we're leasing critical power. So in regards to your question, we would, we would commence uh, later this year and then move in later next year. All right, thank you. I yield back. Question, Robinson or Robinson? He was. Oh, yeah. uh, I got it. It's answered. Thank okay. you. It's answered. Question, Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Chris Pumphrey, uh, this or Joe, you can stay there. That's fine. Either way, a couple. Again, back to the 
the policy, right? This is where we're, we're, it's, it's what's in the best interest of <coughs> taxpayers that are here, making sure there's a reciprocal balancing act, right, for this type of incentive. No different than homestead exemp exemptions for the residential side. Um, it's always good to balance the commercial side. Um, uh, both of these are in um, on the eastern side of the county. Um, I'm making a statement to say that at least there won't be a lot of truck traffic, what I hear, at least beyond construction. Is that right? So we said, exactly. speak to that. That is exactly right. Uh, this will um, not have truck traffic outside of bringing in what's necessary to construct the facility. Um, and then once the, kind of the phasing process, you know, begins, whether it's delivery of servers, which are probably like more UPS trucks or something like that. That is correct. You've got more yeah, UPS kind of trucks or step vans that basically bring the servers. So I would echo um, <clears throat> a little bit of what, what Rob said, that initially there's going to be a, there'll be an influx of construction resources that put these facilities up very quickly. Uh, we, we have our local team here, so we are all the local base from the construction side. Um, and, and yeah, our, our uh, facility that's north of town was, was used with all um, local resources. But you, you'll have some construction traffic initially, but then it, it, it goes down to just more like, you know, UPS vans. There could be some 40-footers and stuff bringing large um, um, uh, deliveries of servers, but uh, usually it's a smaller truck. Okay. okay. All right. My last question, Chris, this goes back to... Um, uh, again, back to the investment policy. As you know, I was the sponsor of the conditions to change our, our investment policy here as well as development authority uh, based on this box that you're currently operating on. <coughs> to my uh, colleague's point here, Co Commissioner Molker, um, did, does any changes need to be made to the policy? Um, do we need to give any consideration or do you think you sufficiently, it fits within the box and there needs to be no more consideration? <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely mm -hmm. definitely fits. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the switch property, this property um, is paying nine thousand dollars a year um, in, in property taxes. Um, and so, <clears throat> I, I don't have the, the the numbers of what it looks like with the hundred million dollar um, investment. But you can just imagine <coughs> pretty significant contribution um, uh, to to the digest. And I feel like what we set forth four or five years ago with the revision of the, the plan and really it's it was really targeting higher wage paying um, companies in, 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 in on the in larger investment and it wasn't so much as before where it was more about the quantity of the jobs and not necessarily the pain of the jobs we've really switched that and we've started to see this change um, in, in, in that area uh, that's that has taken place over the last five years you sufficiently answered my question. Madam Chair, are you? Okay. Attorney Bernard, I believe you have a comment. Yeah. Chris, uh, T5's got to rezone tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And so we don't inf affect the rezoning. Is there any problem with this being conditioned upon that rezoning getting approved? Because it seems to me we're a little bit, we're sort of deciding pre-hearing that we're going to give an abatement on a piece of property that we're that up for rezoning tomorrow night. Is that an issue on timing? Joe, I don't know if you want to speak to that. It's a little bit of a concern of mine. The timing issue is driven by their closing. They wanted they have to close between now and the next meeting. So conditioning it on the closing would be fine. So if we could if we I mean conditioning on the rezoning tomorrow night. Conditioning disapproval on the rezoning tomorrow night. Yeah, but there's another aspect of that, but yes, if you condition <coughs> disapproval on the rezoning, that's fine. Okay. Probably ought to make that amendment. Uh, if we take it up tomorrow because your vote on this issue if it's not table will occur before tomorrow night's rezoning uh, and you can't commit ahead of the public hearing as to how you're going to re if you're going to rezone or not and the conditions of rezoning so, mm -hmm. is that right and i'll get you the revised resolution with the full amount I only wish that they would mention Marines in that group. That's all right. That's all right. We got we got your backside. <laughs> Commissioner My Mitchell is a Marine, but anyway, mm -hmm. Commissioner Mitchell, I think you had to come in. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I think you you going to add to that or something. I was going to wrap things up, but uh, oh, I, I, I do have a quick question. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I do have a, 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 you mentioned a couple of phases, 
and, and, and hopefully it will include not only Marines, but uh, <laughs> Army as well. But okay. <laughs> you mentioned, you mentioned uh, a couple of phases. Um, how many phases are there with what you're going? Because I know, I'm assuming it, is, it has the same type of structure as to the phases, correct, I mean, Chris, where, where the, the, the uh, incentives that's attached to it will be attached to the, the building as it comes into, into its phase, correct? Yeah, so okay. the, um, the, the, the phasing in this is just, it's just all within the building. So oh, there's, okay, not, there's not changes in plans. This okay. is just all within the building. It's just that there's a, um, an investment made within the building to accommodate you know, the first level of client yeah, commitment okay. and then another level within, with, all within that same building. So there's still just one plan um, for the building now. Um, I think what was, uh, Jimmy was alluded to earlier, the site you know, can accommodate you know, future growth, but I think right now the focus is just on that one building. That's correct. Yeah, we we always we always purchase property with some runway um, uh, because, as I said earlier, when the when the infrastructure arrives, it's it's easy to go ahead and continue to expand uh, across the property instead of starting over again. Okay. Okay. I guess I, I guess I, I thought of that as, as a different piece of property and more on on top of the property that you are on in an additional building of some sort. Right. So that's not all, the case. All within that same. All within that same. Okay. Um, outside of that, uh, and, and I'm assuming there is, I'm assuming there is no construction, I guess, that you'll be dealing with as Switch would be dealing with on your site, construction out, outside of what you already are. I'm assuming the building and what you guys are dealing with. Because we're trying to make sure that we at least give a hard look to local uh, when it comes to construction. Right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. and again, we are local, right? Um, and so, um, we're, we we heavily lean on our our local subcontractors and, and contractors here right. in Atlanta. Right. Um, I could walk you through a laundry list of those um, that that uh, have been intricately involved with our uh, with our data center north of town. And, no, and what's Atlanta? Though you speak of Atlanta, I'm, I'm speaking more of Douglas County. Uh, un understood. Okay. Yeah, okay. and what, what usually ends up happening is to get to get down into the weeds a little bit is the the local site. Okay. Uh, in other words, clearing the site, <laughs> moving the dirt, mm -hmm. building the foundations, Absolutely. pouring the concrete. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. We will procure uh, local resources here to do that. As you get as you get deeper into the construction process on the mechanical and electrical systems, those usually grow to more technical subcontractors that again we still pull from the Atlanta area. Yeah. Um, with with that scope as well. Yeah, got it. Okay, okay. Well, outside of that, um, uh, other than all military, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think. Looks like I'm going to be looking for veterans that went yes. to the University of Georgia. Come on, let's go. I can do that. I can do that. But uh, look, I, I just want to echo that we are really, really excited to be expanding uh, into Douglas County. I think everybody in here should be really excited about about uh, what is going on in the data center world and, and how much growth. I think we're early. Mm -hmm. I think this is synonymous with, with, that, with constructing the railroads across our country. It really is because we, are, we see what's going on and, and, and Rob sees what's going on all, all over the world when it's, when, when it's connecting all these data centers together. And there are many rural areas that still need internet. I, I, I agree with you, but data centers are starting to grow in those areas as well. It's public knowledge that a big social media company just announced that they were expanding uh, out east of town. And, um, and those are large investments as well. So, so in general, Atlanta is becoming even more of a data center destination uh, because of all the things we've discussed, because of the, the fiber and the power and the affordability and the incentives. So thank you uh, very much. Mr. Bailey, before I, my um, attorney has a comment, but before he comes in, I just wanted to let you know I stepped out for a second, didn't, uh, and I'm glad to meet you, and I want to recognize you as well. I am moved by what I've heard today. I appreciate everything in this database uh, that initiatives that are coming to Douglas County. I am humbled. And I just want to thank you. So I'm going to ask my uh, my cabinet to stand again. And get you I get a hand too. <laughs> I was not in the room when you came out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Attorney Bernard, you had a question, Chris, I believe. Chris, um, and Joe, this may be more for you, Joe. Um, 
the, the site reference in here is very, it says factory show uh, in constructing a data center facility, factory shows road in Douglas County, the site. We probably, if we're going to have sort of a multi-phase build out that's tied to this abatement, we probably need to have some plat of this. But the Board of Assessors is not going to be able to follow up when it just says the site. We probably need to have some tie-in to some physical description that y'all have or land description or something on this one. Yeah, there'll be a detailed tax memorandum that includes all of that, but I'll change the resolution specifically because we're going to have the zoning condition. Right. So I'll put a street address in it. If you would, really, it typically shows in the bar. Is it on both sides of the road or just one side? One side only. It's 38 acres or there. And that's all that's part of this that's that's in that's in. As long as it's got a, a, a little bit more defined reference point. I'll give you a street address and the tax part. Okay. Oh, well. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. We don't have any other questions from the Board of Commissioners. Okay, tab number eight. We have a resolution in support of locating a driver's license renewal center in Douglas County. And that uh, resolution will be led by uh, Director Stanley. Good morning, Chairman Good morning. Jones and Commissioners. Um, as part of our legislative agenda for 2018, um, on page 11, we have listed um, um, people who are requesting funding for a driver's license renewal facility in Douglas County. I've been working with our state delegation, specifically uh, Representative Gravely, and um, he's been in communications with the Department of Driver Services, and they are requesting a resolution in support of locating the Georgia um, Department of Driver Services Community Customer Service Center here in Douglas County. Um, we're not at the population where we can get the full center, but um, we are in the preliminary stages of getting the renewal center. Um, so they are just requesting a resolution in support of that effort. Any questions from the Board of Commissions? <coughs> yes, uh, Tiffany, I know that the, uh, the Department of Safety requires square footage mm -hmm. uh, that we pay for. Yes, so uh, this has a budget <coughs> impact. Mm -hmm. That's so correct. before we give a resolution, we got to have all the facts too. What, oh, do we have a site uh, picked out? Um, how much is it going to cost? Because everybody wants, especially the seniors, want the uh, uh, driver's license uh, facility here. Yes. So they don't have to drive to Carrollton or mm -hmm. Marietta or whoever. But um, <clears throat> we've got to have more information before we do a resolution. All right. Well, this is, this is in the very preliminary stages. In order for them to even move forward, they have requested this going forward. Um, I've been in discussions with our county administrator um, about looking for locations, so and we have not found a final location. There has been some discussion about possibly the new tag and tax build, build, tax commissioner building, but we haven't gotten anything solidified with I that. I think it's going to be real yeah. over there, but uh, how much is square footage that they require? I don't have that information right now. I can get that for you. But this is just, like I said, in order for them to even move forward with discussions, Representative Gravely has requested that we um, get the resolution done before we can even move forward. Well, I understand. We, I mean, most people want this. Yes. Yeah. But what are we obligating ourselves to? Okay. Right. Well, this doesn't obligate us to anything. This resolution just says that we are in support of having that facility placed here. None of the details have been worked out, but in my discussions with our delegation and Representative Gravely, before any, they would consider anything else, they want the resolution from us, and they also want a signed letter from our delegation stating that they are in support of it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much. Tab number nine. Well, first of all, any um, new business or any business to discuss from our county administrator? Do you have any business today? No, ma'am, not today. Okay. Tab number nine, authorization to approve an equitable sharing agreement and certification and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. District Attorney Fortner, how are you today? Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Commissioners, members of the public. Uh, each year I appear back before this body to discuss our equitable sharing agreement and certification. As a, a brief reminder, the Department of Justice and the Department of Treasury oversee and enable a program called equitable sharing by which federal agencies 
and local and state agencies share in the disbursement of, of funds equitably that are seized uh, during some type of criminal investigation that involves multi-agency work. For example, uh, your local agencies like the Sheriff's Department or the City Police will oftentimes have an officer embedded, for example, with the DEA to work with them on cases that impact Douglas County, whether it's drugs passing through the county, drugs being sold in the county, but those types of, of investigations. Well, this program allows for when assets are seized in accordance with one of those investigations for it to be shared with the local agencies as well. But for that to happen, each year we have to come back before the board and execute one of these equitable sharing agreements that recognizes that we agree to be bound by the rules and regulations put forth by the Department of Justice and the Department of Treasury regarding the collection and expenditure of those funds. They maintain uh, the right to audit those at any time. There's a se separate accounting completely from any type of state funds that may be seized. So there is an account uh, fund balance that they can monitor. And for expenditures to be made out of this program, we now actually contact the Department of Justice before we make an expenditure, just as sort of a pre-screening mechanism to make sure that the expenditure is going to be uh, authorized pursuant to the rules and regulations. It's one of those situations where you may go a year without there being any funds placed into that account. It just depends on what's happening in the investigations. But it continues to be monitored each year um, despite the lack of any new additional funds. It's a program that the Department of uh, Justice and Department of Treasury and actually the Attorney General control and could end at any moment in time. And there's been discussions about that uh, through the years, there have been moments where it's been frozen, there have been moments where it opened back up, there have been changes in what is allowed to be purchased with these types of funds, so it's something that's regulated by the uh, federal government, and we have to abide by their rules and regulations in regards to these expenditures. But it is something that has allowed us to use these types of funds to the benefit um, of doing our job in the district attorney's office. Um, for example, the only expenditures we had this year, we bought some office equipment as well as purchasing the ongoing gang database software that allows us to communicate, our agencies to communicate with other jurisdictions so that we're sharing information about gang activities. It also allows for some disbursement with limitations to 501c3 organizations within a jurisdiction that share this same purpose of guiding children or people away from a life of crime. So those are the only areas we've utilized it. Uh, but we're asking that the chairman and the board approve continuing to take part in this program and to sign the related documents. And that's why we're here. Okay. Any questions from the board commissioners or comment? Comments? Yes. Commissioner yes. Mitchell? And again, this is what we've always done. There's nothing right. changed outside of just continuing this particular process. Exactly. It, it requires us to come back every year okay, and yes. renew this program, basically. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, last but not least, what, what happens to outside of liquid asset? What, what, what happens to um, a car or, or a truck or something that you guys see? Typically, okay. most of this is going to have to do with, almost all of it really, is going to have to do with property that's seized by the federal government okay. that the local agencies have to take a part in. <laughs> if we were doing a seizure like that, you would follow the rules regarding uh, the sale or disposal of that type of equipment, and then the funds received from that ship, Got from it. that sale, would be dispersed according to the statute, and they do the same thing. So. Got it. And, and, and I'm assuming this relationship uh, also uh, engages the uh, city of uh, Douglasville as well, their, their officers as well, from my understanding. I mean, like I said, nothing. Really, it's right. one of those situations that it promotes all of your law enforcement That's agencies correct. and correct. prosecutors' offices to be working together yeah, right. because we share the same problems with exactly. our neighboring counties. Exactly. And, and I, 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 I just want to make sure, just for the public record, that you kind of make sure you make that known that this is just not just it's Douglas County. Something ongoing. Right, yes. With okay. all the agencies involved. Thank you. All right. Yes. And I yield back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Tab number 10, authorization to apply for the 2018 BAWA, which is Violence Against Women Act, grant from the Georgia Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, CJCC, for funding for an additional domestic violence 
per, uh, prosecutor position within the Solicitor General's Domestic Violence Unit and authorize the chairman <coughs> to sign all the many documents. Solicitor General uh, Matthew Kroll. Kroll, how are you today? Good morning, Madam Chair and members mm -hmm. of the board, uh, uh, directors, and all my friends and colleagues. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I appreciate you having me before you this morning. The uh, Violence Against Women Act grant was uh, reauthorized to ask for uh, new funding opportunities. We already have one VAWA grant within my office that I came before this body in December of last year to ask to go to the continuation grant because it's a, a three-year grant period. Well, <clears throat> they are going to allow for new uh, funding opportunities and with that, we felt it would be uh, imperative uh, to fund another prosecutor of the domestic violence unit, mm -hmm. which we have uh, we have gained leaps and bounds since we started this unit in 2014. Uh, with the services we provided and the victims we've served and the rehabilitation we've done of the defenders has really improved over that time uh, since prior to I took since prior to me taking office, it's really improved. Um, and this Board of Commissioners have always been very supportive of um, helping us, assisting us to end domestic violence in Douglas County, which is one of my goals. Uh, with that being said, this additional prosecutor will allow us to serve those victims and hopefully rehabilitate those offenders uh, more efficiently and effectively as we go forward. I'll take any questions. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Comments? That was easy. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, keep bringing those data centers, man. That's great. <laughs> Listen, yes. these people need jobs. We got people in my court, they need jobs. They need good jobs. So I, I applaud you all for doing the work and, and helping out. So thank you. Thank you so much. I got to go back to court, though. Tab number 11. Authorize the chairman to execute a contract with Christopher Sandbach as an assistant public defender in the state court. Um, Attorney Monica Miles, public defender. Good morning. Uh, this request, first of all, there's no impact on the budget. It's uh, just our typical whenever we lose an employee who's an attorney, which are contract position, um, then we need to fill that position and hire a new attorney. So we lost one of our attorneys in December, Rachel Sedelska. We received a job working elsewhere. And so we have hired Christopher Sandbach to replace her. We ended up moving some people up into her position and then subsequent positions. So the entry level would be this Mr. Christopher Sandbach to be in state court as assistant public defender. And um, we'd ask that you guys approve the contract. Questions about that? Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? One, one question. Just Commissioner Guyton. Just to clarify, you moved someone up to take the position that you lost. That's correct. And so this is entry level for the new employee. That's this correct. is a new employee, right? That's correct. Okay. I go back. Okay. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Public Defender, I've got a, a, just a general question. How many public defender, how, many, how much staff do you have? In general. Staff do we have? Yeah. We have uh, four public defenders, attorneys, I'm sorry, in state court. We have three investigators. There are nine additional attorneys. There's 13 attorneys total, but nine attorneys are, eight are assigned to superior court, and then we have one accountability court attorney, so we have a total of 13 attorneys, and then our support staff is five. And, and so again, this is just to make you whole. I know we just went through the budget process, but I always try to balance this question in comparison against uh, the DA. Um, and and, and are, can you, are you able to keep up with this, with the pace? We do the best we can. You know, a lot of times people forget because we can't really compare us to the DA's office. You can't compare us to the solicitor's <coughs> office if we do both. Right. You know, where, so, yeah, so we do the best we can. We obviously could use more staff at times, but. Mm. I just want to make that point. Thank right. you. I I'm good. That. Thank you. <laughs> okay, any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much. Next, tab number 12, authorization to file a grant applica 
application with the Atlanta Regional Commission for Federal Funds for the Senior Adult and Disabled Individual Transportation Voucher Program for the period July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. Thank you, Director Watson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we're asking in this grant application for $87,184 in federal money, mm -hmm. which will re require a local match of $59,296. Now, in this particular program, in this grant application, there are two levels of federal local funding. Uh, for the voucher portion of it, and this is where we sell vouchers to the the clients in the program, and they in turn use these to pay for their transportation. That's a 50-50 match. So we're asking for $50,000 in federal money uh, for vouchers, which will require a $50,000 local match. Mm -hmm. Now the other portion of that is for staffing, and that's an 80-20 match. And what we're asking for is uh, 80% uh, salary for our mobility coordinator, which would be $27,200. And I'm, with this particular grant application, I'm also asking for um, the grant to fund a 20 hour per week part-time voucher clerk, which would help us in the administration portion mm -hmm. uh, of the program. Um, and the, the split on that would be $9,984 federal, $2,496 local. So again, the total amount federal is $87,184, uh, local is $59,296. And if we receive the amount of funding that, that we're requesting, uh, this would allow us to add about 30 new clients to the program. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're serving 90 now, this would uh, allow us to move up to, uh, to 120. Okay. And this would not have any impact um, on the budget. I built this in to the uh, 2018 budget. Of course, if they do uh, approve the part-time clerk that we're talking about, um, I would need to come back before you and get permission to um, uh, generate that that position. Okay. <laughs> Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Mr. Watson, um, Mr. Watson I have uh, just a comment or even just a question also. Can you tell me, I believe your operation is primarily funded by grants. I've been reading your voucher pro program has been under <coughs> number and other things that you provide. Can you talk about your grants because your operation run primarily off grants is that correct yes ma'am we all of our facilities have been built with federal money mm -hmm. uh, for instance the transportation center uh, the first phase of it was about a six million dollar project and federal grants paid 80 percent of that which would be what 4.8 million dollars um, all the vans that we purchased for our van pool program, that's an 80-20 uh, split uh, as well. Um, and I just explained our, our voucher program and, and the different splits that we have for that. So, um, and since this program has been in existence since 1986, we've received about $15 million in federal and state grants. Okay. Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Geider? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mary, I was looking at the facts and figures that's out there on the internet on our website, and your ridership for the van and for, for Greta, of course I know you don't do that, but is down from 2014 to 2016. It is. Why is it going down? We've tried to, to take a look at that. <clears throat> And there, there's several factors. The main one are, are gas prices. They got down so low uh -huh. that the people decided that they were uh, just going to take in their personal cars uh, to work. Also, more and more people are telecommuting. They're being allowed to work from home, and and that's uh, made us take a hit as even, well. Even the number of vans that uh, you have in service. <clears throat> you don't have as many now as you did in 2014. You're right. 
and the revenues, I was surprised at that, mm -hmm. uh, going way down. Yeah, it's a con concern of us. We obviously, and, obviously, we track that. Now, the, the facts and figures that's on the website right now, they don't show 2017. Do you have those figures yet so that we can do a comparison? <coughs> we do. Uh, and, I, and, and, that, and that downward trend has continued, yes. It has, because I noticed that in the budget, your, the collections of revenues for ride share is down by 25%. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was kind of surprising. I thought it would was growing. Everything else seems to be growing. Yeah, we need we need gas prices to come back up to about three dollars, three dollars and twenty five cents a gallon. <laughs> well, they're up to two sixty five yeah, now. So. They're, they're creeping back up. <laughs> but I, and I don't understand that because we have all this uh, new, all these new gas lines and stuff. Like uh, I was just alarmed uh, that the figures are going down and the ridership is going down. It's a concern of ours too, obviously. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Also, uh, <coughs> Gary, we've had discussions earlier. I asked the same question probably mm -hmm. about a year ago when I first hit office about you said because of the gas prices are down. So those gas prices just continue to cover, which is good in some respect. I asked the question too, Commissioner Van. Thank you for chime in on that. I said, why are, is it decreasing? And he said, because the gas prices are so good right now. So I don't know if it's a it's a blessing or what a curse, but uh, I like my gas prices down. I'm not quite sure a lot of other people do too. But uh, we will provide that information for yeah. Commissioner Guyton sure. and myself. I would like to see it. Yes. Yes. So any other questions from the yes. Board of Commissioners? Yes. Commissioner yes. Mitchell. Yes. So, so with that being said, uh, there's a good to be gas pricing and understood, well understood as to, so so what are we doing? I mean, so it, it, it appears if this particular train continues that we may not need this type of service, correct? So so what are our plans to kind of deal with that, that type of train? Do we just sit and wait till the gas prices go back to $3 and then say, oh yeah, we, we, we're back in business? Or do we, what are we doing to kind of, because other than that, what is it costing us on top of that? for not doing anything? Well, th there's there's a couple of responses okay. to that. Uh, number one, even with the, our revenue declining, okay. uh, our van pool program is still self-sufficient. The day-to-day -day operations of the van pool itself are paid through uh, our, our ridership fees. And, and so it's covering itself, it's covering even, itself. even with the gas prices lower and, and in the situation that we're in. Correct. Because from my understanding, a, a recent meeting I was at, the, we're noticing a lot of van vans are being parked and off to the side somewhere. So that is true now that we understand that this whole decline at 25%. Right. But the good news is it's still paying for itself. It, yes, sir. Through the ridership. Yes, sir. It's exactly. still riding and continue to, to ride. Right. Uh, and to, and to, your, to, to your other point, uh, we continue to try to market and promote our program as much as we can with limited staff and, and limited financial resources. Um, we make a lot of public appearances. Uh, we participated in the Christmas parade, the Veterans Day parade, the Fourth of July parade, uh, senior citizens picnic, hydrangea financial festival, uh, Case of Douglas, right. th things like that, mm -hmm. that that are low cost but gives us the opportunity to meet a lot of people. So that, we do try to do our marketing as, as best we can. Right, right, and that's good. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's that double-edged sword mm -hmm. type of situation that we're dealing with. So I mean, I, I, I get it. So it's good to know that it's down, but, um, but the understanding what I'm trying to make sure that we're, we're kind of making sure that it's not costing the county any additional funding outside no, of sir. The ridership paying for itself, so that's a, that's a good to know. So other than vans, I guess we we have less maintenance on on several vans because we have maybe I'm going to say a third. I'm not sure if that is. There's that's, there's not even as many vans running, uh, so that cuts down our, our exactly maintenance right. costs. That's exactly right. Okay. The other question I got, um, the uh, you're talking about hiring a part time. Am I correct for item number number twelve? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, in addition to Ms. Ms. Jones, her name? Ms. Jones. Okay. This, this would be a clerk basically to just help her with the administrative. Because we just upped her salary to become full-time. Because she was 
part time right, right. about a year ago. Yes, okay. sir. And, and now we're asking for an assistant for her to now accommodate possibly 120 seniors versus 990 that she would be dealing with. Yes, sir. Because we just got an additional uh, grant funding to possibly pay for some additional uh, seniors. <coughs> if, if we get the funding uh, levels that we asked for in, the, in this grant, and as I've mentioned to y'all before, this, this program is uh, administratively intense. There's so much paperwork in, oh, I know. involved I, with it. Listen, I get the calls, and I, and I get that part. I'm just trying to make sure I'm clearly getting what you're saying, though. So, so we're, we're at 90 now, <coughs> and you're increasing it to 120. Yes, sir. If we get the funding and if we get the funding. And how much of that funding that we're matching? Is there any matching to go with the funding, the additional funding that for, that you're applying for? Well, for the the only, uh, I'm asking for more money for the vouchers, but the, the only real extra money I'm asking for is for the part-time uh, voucher clerk, and, and the county's share of that would be $2,496. Monthly or annually? That's annually. Also, oh, an additional two thousand dollars to pull off a part time work Correct. to help do what you're doing. Yes, sir. to add some additional seniors to kind of make this work. Yes, sir. you got it. So it has nothing to do with the voucher, the additional vouchers that the seniors will get. It will be mainly for the part time that you're bringing on board. Correct. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Good stuff. All right. Um, uh, outside of that, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. I'll you back. Okay. Any other questions from board commissioners? No. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Tab number 13, authorization to amend the tax commissioner's budget for $4,484 for a check received from the Department of Revenue from for the tax kiosk program to be used uh, to purchase an additional kiosk. Is the tax commissioner here? No. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> That's interesting. You sneaked in on me. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Banks. I just did you guys had some questions on the four thousand dollars. It is a fee that's paid back from the state for us using the kiosk. Mm -hmm. So basically what we did is we took the other kiosks out of last year's budget that was in last year's budget. And I would like to just use that money to get another kiosk for District 4, Mrs. Geithner's area. <laughs> highway 5. Yes, Highway 5. So basically, I'm just using those fees mm -hmm. to get another kiosk. And what I've learned is they're paying us a commission back on that. That $4,000 came back for us using the kiosk. My goal is to get three of the kiosks. A lot of the tax commissioners have three and the state paid them back almost $15,000. Mm -hmm. So every time I get a kiosk, you can look at almost an income of about $5,000 per kiosk is my goal. So that one will go in Ms. Geithner's area this this time, and then I'm looking at one for the Kroger's and Lithia Springs, and that'll give us three, well, that'll give us four, because we got one in this Kroger, one in the courthouse, put one in Ms. Geithner and another, and you should you should get a return of about five thousand dollars per kiosk each year. That's what the other tax commissioners are net. That when I talked to them at our winter uh, conference, that's what they were getting per kiosk. <coughs> so that's all I'm asking for because, yeah, as you know, we got rid of the BIR. So all I want to do is make sure we get that over there on Highway Five and get that revenue coming in this year. So. That's basically it. Mr. Baker, thank you for taking the time to meet, meet with me so we could discuss this amount because I shared with you that it was tabled. But when you expressed that this was specifically for District 4, for that particular area, and you, you talked about some points, some various areas you didn't mm -hmm. really specify. Is it the Dog River area for District 4? Or well, it's uh, exciting. basically Dog River. I, I'm looking at the library. I don't know how that's going to work. Hopefully I can sit with Ms. Geithner. She can pull some I'll strings somewhere. Yeah, pull some strings. <laughs> somewhere, over, somewhere over somewhere over in that area. Well, that's where we want to put it so that the folks don't have to come all the way to the courthouse. They can use that machine and go over. And it's working great here and in Kroger's because Kroger's is the one that got us the four thousand dollars. So people are using it. 
So wherever we put it, I'm sure that it'll save them a trip all the way to the courthouse and eventually save me some part-time dollar money that I'm using that okay. is the goal. Okay. Commissioner Bennett, I don't believe you have a question. Uh, well, it's not really, of course. Well, I guess it is. <laughs> uh, about how many transactions do you do per kiosk? I didn't bring that information with me, okay. but I will get back and to I, you. And I remember reading it in the facts and figures, but I can't remember what it said. Yeah, and I can't even All these numbers, that I know. Yeah, I came straight here, so I, I, don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I'll get it for you. But uh, that area uh, that you're talking about, the Kroger on Highway 5 and uh, West, no, Stuart Mill Road, uh, uh, is uh, you've got apartments behind there, you've got apartments across the street, and, and there's a lot of um, residents right there. There's really not even that amazing with Douglas County. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, I'm happy that you selected that site. Thank you. And I commend you on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, we worked on it. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? <coughs> Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. So, uh, Rick, are there any other costs that, that's associated with even trying to put the house where we're trying to put the house? That, you know, is there like some upfront cost that you need to kind of tie it down, secure it, blah, 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 whatever that stuff is? Nope. Or are you just going to drop it in, you know? Once I get the upfront cost done, uh, there's no there's cost to us. They, they resupply it. They do everything. We no, have no, no other. So, what's that upfront cost to, to kind of put in that quote? Is, is there any cost to put in a quote mm. to kind of? I'm assuming to secure it to kind of, you know. Actually, they they do the upfront cost. They run the cable and everything for it. Uh, no, the, the uh, site the kiosk people, Max. They run everything for it. That's what it costs us upfront. They do all the upfront costs, and once that's in, it, we get the revenue back from it. And, and I'm assuming that also kind of becomes an expense to you and hopefully getting a, a profit somewhere down the road. I'm assuming, but I don't think they do it for free. Uh, Correct. Okay. It was in last okay. year's That's budget and we right. put it, we put it in. But uh, my I'll just okay. tell you this, my goal is I'm gonna pay for one and I'm gonna get one free is my goal. Understood. Okay. I, I so just, I'm I'm right now I'm negotiating with them. I'll put in another one, but then the other one I'm trying to get for free. Understood. Understood. Um, so, with that being said, I'm glad that at least this board, and, and thanks for our conversation about this whole makeup, um, that we are understanding that, well, let me make sure though that the legal and everybody get a chance to make sure that were there any ties to this particular monies as to where, it, where we could spend or not spend, or was it just directly to the tax commission as we had our conversation to make sure that there were no ties to this particular money that we... <coughs> no, I, I, strings. everything goes... Everything I do is going to go back to the general fund, regardless. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm just, I want to make sure there was no ties based on you guys finding, because that was the whole premise of what we were asking. I mean, and you're fine. I'm just asking us that we, that we find out whether or not there was. If there isn't, I'm glad to hear. If there is, he needs to know. Huh? <coughs> there is not. Okay, well, good. So with that being said, so uh, I, I'm glad to hear that you are looking at putting it in this direction of getting another kiosk and so on and so forth. Uh, however, at your option or at your leisure, you could have to get what you want to do to buy, you know, furniture for the new building of some sort. Uh, but I'm not saying that what you, that what you, you did, I'm glad what you're doing. Okay. However, I'm just, just trying to make sure that if there were some ties that we clearly identified that, so you'll, not only we know, but you know, that maybe it was some kind of tie that you had to buy a kiosk or you had to do something with the system itself that we're dealing with. But if they're saying there is none, there is none. Then, then do what you're doing and, and the great job that you're doing with what you got. So again, thank you. I yield back. Okay. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? If, if you would just promise me that you would have a ribbon cut, cutting ceremony and invite them. For district four, I, I will promise. Like you did in the. Mrs. Uh, Geiser, I will have a ribbon statements. cutting for her area down there. Yeah, because you know, you held one in the courthouse and Rick, you filmed that, so if you could make sure that that happens, that, I'm excited. So thank you. Okay. All right, let, uh, tab number 14 authorization to approve a contract with Amerisco for professional services. Uh, for comprehensive energy services and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. And this uh, item also was tabled from the work session January 22nd, uh, 2018. And Director Worthington. 
Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. As you said, this was the table. Um, the I was tasked with getting an alternate, uh, some options for this, seeing if there's any additional savings available. Um, as Brad from Amerisco can tell you, we've, we've been in contact an awful lot um, over the last few weeks. And I was looking at some options. So option one that we started with um, was just to see if we could keep the same scope of work nothing changed except the sale price, so to speak. Um, and there was really no room for that. Their margins are pretty tight, so they, they couldn't really adjust the price. So the second option we were looking at was... Hey, James. Yes, sir. It did go down to three, four. Oh, right, okay. So it did change a little bit from the last uh, official, the, the first iteration of the investment grade on it. Um, the second measure we were looking at were just doing the, the, the top five, so to speak, based on simple payback. Um, simple payback is basically your cost versus your savings. Um, we were looking at the top five, which were uh, 3.8 years up to 12 years. Um, some of the lower payback things went all the way to 123 years. So we had looked at cutting off some of those that were using the money from the good stuff to pay for the bad stuff. Um, the, the downfall to that is if we go that route, uh, we wouldn't be able to do the, the ones that don't pay for themselves, if that makes sense. Uh, so essentially, yes, they all would save energy costs, but some of them take, uh, well, like um, the rooftop unit replacement, they've estimated it out to take 123 years to pay for itself. So, so, so we looked at possibly just doing the top five, which would give you a huge amount of savings for the, a minimum amount of dollars, kind of your best bang for your buck, so to speak. Uh, we went back and forth with that, thought we were going one way, and then decided that wouldn't work either. So. I went through looking at just costs for if county, if if we were the contractor and we were looking at things. Um, sorry. So I went through their their lighting, everything on the energy grade audit, uh, investment grade audit, each lamp, each cost, and these are costs that we're we're paying now. Um, either us as property management or Mark Price is paying for. Uh, these are, most of these are available on state contracts, so we have the bulk buying power that's, that's good anyways. Um, we went through some options. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is just the top five. Uh, that was the first thing that we kind of went back and forth with. If we could do the top five, the, the project cost would be roughly 52% of the original cost, but you would still get 74% of the savings. So that was the one I was kind of hoping for because we would cut half the cost off and only lose a quarter of the, the savings. So we would out with it. But, uh, we went through some other options. They just wouldn't play out with Amerisco. They, they couldn't make the numbers work on their end. Um, so I, we came up with some options on our end if we do uh, the, <coughs> the energy saving measures. Um, the, I went through the top five using just the projected savings that they were given. Um, and I came up with these numbers that basically we can do the cost of each of these measures for literally a fraction of the cost. Um, the downside of that being we can't do everything that they can propose. So you've got the all in with them or you have an option to go with much less. Literally we can do um, about 10% of the cost and still yield close to 75% of the savings. Um, so I came up with a, a, an alternate um, doing $200,000 a year as a budget number to, to be split between property management and Mark Price for the courthouse. Uh, and it, it would be upgrading all your LED lights, doing the ice machine heat exchangers, the vending machine controls, and upgrading some of the oldest HVAC units. <laughs> right now we have around 140 something HVAC units. 
the ones proposed to be replaced, they're all grouped together, but they're, they're kind of in the mid-pack of our, our list. Um, there are about 40 units that are older than these. So currently, as property management goes, we're replacing on average 10 or 11 a year, uh, but they're kind of a as-needed basis. It's not necessarily the oldest. It's just, you know, if they're beyond repair. So we do have uh, a few that are from 99, um, a few in 2000, 2001. If we went the route of upgrading this and just set a budget of 50000 a year to do in-house, we could do five to 10 per year and that price would change. I mean, the price is set, but we, the amount we could do would change based on the size of units we did. The 10 ton units cost us around 10,000, five tons we could do about. So it's we're around a thousand dollars a ton. So we can do five to ten according to which size they are. So over the course of a few years, we kind of catch back up and, and get to a. The goal for me was a fifteen-year age limit on our HVA set. Uh, so that's your option. Um, either us doing it as a partial, or Amerisco doing it as a full. The one big difference. If we do it, uh, there would be no no financing. Uh, the 200,000 a year would be provided. We could do it over three years. Um, we would start with all the lighting and then do some of the HVAC each of the three years. Um, the biggest difference, yes, we don't have the, the full amount of savings that we could if we go all in, uh, but the cost is significantly less at only 600000 over three years um, versus the $2.5 million. And the, the biggest difference on, on the uh, business model of Amerisco is to break even, do as much as you can do, and at no cost, which will work. Uh, but if you went the other way, we would put a little over a million in the general fund in that same 15-year time period. And save how much on project costs and financing? Uh, the finance cost is around 700000 and the soft costs were 480 something. So uh, uh, over a million. Plus installation. Correct. So that's two drastically different options, <laughs> but it's an option. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Geiger? Yes, ma'am. Um, how can we have a separate vote on this? Um, I know we tabled it, so we have to put it back on the agenda, but can we also remove it from the consent agenda for a separate vote? That's what I recommend. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, that can be done. Thank you. Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners or comment? Commissioner Robinson, Vice Chairman. That would look complicated. <laughs> My colleague leaned over mm -hmm. and asked that I've seen that, and I'm not in this distance, but I can follow it um, per se. I'm going to give context to what this is about. If we go back, you know, uh, B Madam Chair, B, um, B Madam, uh, before her. Um, this was the process that was started um, two years ago um, prior administration to look at how do we deal with this. And this is before we got into the long-term capital planning that came out of 16. And one of the things that, that I used to harp on over those prior six or seven years was this every other year. Again, this is before we really got, but it was just sort of that intuitive that says, there's got to be a better way. We know that. HVACs break down. Why can't we anticipate that and smooth out our spending over time? Right? Now, we went through this process. We brought some vendors in. Again, Con Ed, you know, we looked at this whole process. We educated ourselves. <coughs> and it, there was always this um, notion from the administration they could do it themselves. Right? That, that we, we can do this. All right? And so the challenge was, well, show us a plan. Right? So we went through this whole process, we brought in vendors, and so they're standing saying, well, we, we can do it ourselves. We're like, show us a plan, right? 
We went through this whole process last year. We awarded the contract to do the investment grade. There's still reservations within administration that said, we can do this ourselves, but it's like, show us a plan, right? We get down here to this investment grade audit. We get the results of it. They're coming up with a counter proposal. I'm, I'm looking at it, but I'm, I'm, I gotta evaluate this, right? And I'm like, but you've reverse engineered a vendor's proposition, all in. And I'm listening to this, and I'm like, well, there's 30 buildings. I mean, this, this is, I, I gotta break it down for the public. There's 30 buildings that were proposed, not including the jail. And there's 30 more buildings of 40 out there outstanding, give or take. Is that accurate? Uh, that's, yeah, there's 38 or 39 in this car. Good enough. Uh, Good then, enough. Yeah, around 30 smaller concession bathroom houses, right. things like that. All right. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. So here's, we're looking for efficiency. We're looking for, uh, we had our municipal advisors weigh in um, that says that, yes, we understand that there's a premium you guys are paying for this. But it was, staff, show us a plan, right? And I'm looking at this, and I'm trying to get us down. It's the discipline to look long term. It's to lay out our expenses over time. And so it's like, well, they've got a proposition for 30 buildings. Um, you believe that you can do the other part. This is sort of like transportation, right? Like, we, we, we think we can do this, right? Well, take the other 30 buildings. Show us a plan how you move those forward or the rest or whatever the balance of the buildings are. And through over time, we, 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 we institutionalize learning. Again, this is a professional <coughs> services contract. And I, again, we've been studying this and studying this and, yes, sir, studying this for a while, right? And one of the things that I'll, when we talk about doing business with Douglas, I, I think that there's a line that says that we, we listen to people's proposals. And that's one thing that we just did to audit. They did an audit. It's another that they propose a solution. Those are two separate things. Right? Remember, to go back to the breakup causes. Go, break up, go back to what, what this was really about. Go back to what we negotiated initially that says, hey, the intent here is that we would move forward with the solution if we came up with something that was sufficient. Yes, we, our lawyer did good, so we, we're not saying that he did not put conditions in there for us. But again, it was always back to how do we move ourselves forward to replace equipment that we know we got to have? Right? Replacing equipment that we know we gotta have. And I, I again I'm looking at the the trade off on this and I I I, I would be hesitant that we should not hear you you took their model and you revert like what? And think about we just said we're doing business with Douglas that you can come in and we can evaluate as is, but then we're competing against our I mean, look what we're doing. That <coughs> concerns me. It's the principle. It's like, oh, so obvious. Now, no, I had not seen this, so this is like real time, just like, okay, what do you want me to do? Like right now, process what you just said, you know I do get it, but I'm like, I, I, it's the process that we just took um, uh, in front of the public that that was sufficient, that that was appropriate to reverse engineer, think about some of the vendors that would be in here, some of the small businesses that pitched us as government. We gotta be very careful of how government moves on citizens for ideas. Right? We should have been able to evaluate this cleanly as is versus a proposition of, the, of us against the, the, the person that pitched. I mean, that, that's my issue with what I just heard. Which, to answer your question, no, I had not seen this. This has not been presented to me in writing, no. Uh, but uh, I'm going to stop with that. And again, I, I agree with Madam Geider. Take it off the um, consent agenda and move it to uh, vote uh, independently. But I, I just, for the record, uh, for the county administrator and staff to understand that, that bothered me. I go back. Okay. Any other questions of uh, Commissioner Bullock here? Yeah, a reference to uh, mm -hmm. Vice Chairman Robinson's remarks. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tired. <laughs> kind of tired of this particular issue, too. But I, I do feel like uh, staff has responded mm -hmm. uh, to our request that they, they come up with a plan. And how they came up with it, uh, yeah. I guess uh, I guess you could say they used the, the vendor information and, and statistics and, and uh, analyses and so forth uh, to come up with their own staff-centric uh, plan. 
but ultimately uh, our responsibility is to use to our, our general fund and taxpayers and so forth. And we have to balance that against what we feel is an obligation to a, a third party or bidder that comes in and presents a plan. And we don't entirely like it. We, maybe we don't entirely understand it. But uh, over time, uh, we come to a maturity of thought uh, about the plan and really what our goal is. And that's, that's to save taxpayers money and become more, more energy efficient. So is it, is it appropriate to, uh, I wouldn't even say uh, uh, borrow, but uh, borrow some of their uh, Vendors analysis, I personally don't have a problem with it uh, because that's kind of a, kind of the cost of business. We didn't sign any contract saying, well, whatever you tell us now, this uh, we're not going to use it. Uh, I think any vendor that comes in, I don't care what, what the project would be, whether it's energy conservation or, or transportation or, or parks and rec or whatever, uh, we have to balance in, you know uh, 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 several issues at one time. Uh, so I'm, I understand what you're saying. I'm sensitive to it. I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, but I think I just disagree with you a little bit. And I, I yield back. Okay. Any other questions? Jared. Mm -hmm. Just one quick. But, okay, so I'm going to go back to, and this is back to our, you and I's conversation about conservation and long term. Um, and what I'm hearing is this is going to be no cost. Their solution is no cost us through savings. And those savings are guaranteed by a public company um, that has uh, roughly 109 clients, over $300 million worth of credit, and is not in, in the position of default. Um, I'm, I'm curious how we get, now again, they're guaranteeing savings. I'm, I'm just James. Um, uh, is that accurate? Is that still on the table, or did that change? No, that's still on the table. That's all. So they're, they're the only changes on the audit side, um, the the price did drop um, sixty thousand dollars, or um, total of eighty five. So. so that was just based off some errors in calculations. We pointed out some things. They changed it. Came back. Um, so that's all, all that was originally discussed, and the original intent is still on the table. Okay. So it was reduced. It's still guaranteeing. There's no cost, and savings will <coughs> pay for this equipment. That's yeah, true. Correct. Right? So there is no cost to the general fund to realize a more efficient way, long term, to replace capital equipment. Is that true? Correct. Okay. Are you? Yeah. Madam Chair, a question. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Rolf here. Okay. Uh, I think one thing we have to look at is, is, uh, is capability, you know. Bandwidth, if you will. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson likes likes to use that term. It's a good one. Uh, what you know? What is our capability versus uh, outside vendor providing the services at, at no cost uh, versus uh, the cost for the county to do these services? And do you have the capacity and the manpower to do them in a timely way? What is, What is your opinion? So our capabilities are are there on some of the measures and not on some of the others. And I'll elaborate on that. Um, the lighting measures, um, there's a staff electrician in the courthouse and we have a staff electrician in property management. We're already changing things over to LED as they come to an um, end of useful life already. Um, so we're capable of doing that. Same thing in the courthouse. They've changed, I don't, Mark's not here to, to talk about, I think they've changed around 25% of the lighting here over to LED. Uh, we're both on the same page that the plan going forward is only LED. So that's the lighting side is, is we're definitely capable of. The, all of that would be in-house with the exception of um, lighting that requires aerial lifts, like your parking lot lighting, um, canopy lighting, things like that. Now, forgive me, I want, I want to interrupt you now. Sure. What, what, let's talk about the, the heavier uh, equipment and so forth. Are we, we're, are we going to need to contact, contract out some of that work? So on, on your HVAC stuff, we contract out rooftop units because they require a crane and you have to be certified. You have to have a certified uh, HVAC guy with crane certification. That's something we don't have. Um, the prices that I've included include contracting that out. On anything that's on the ground, we do that. Your typical split systems, your typical you know, all of the smaller, up to 10 ton, I guess we would do. 
in house. Okay. Um, has this information been uh, given to the commissioners? Uh, this uh, other than just presentation uh, right now. No, and I'm sorry because at the middle of last week we were going down a different path trying to do the top five and having the contractor do it. And then when they said they couldn't do that, we we were scrambling to put together this direction on our end. All right. um, so I was putting this together through the weekend too. So all right, if you would get that to all of us, I appreciate it. So essentially, we asked for the top five, the top five energy saving measures because there were some items on here that had a 111 year payback, a 123 year payback, a 79 year payback. 29 year payback so we asked for the top five um and i didn't talk to amoresco james did but we don't have those numbers from amoresco as of now on right? the top five side yeah. they're, they're not going to provide that now. and for example like the rooftop units you know if you divide out their cost that they're charging us it's twenty thousand dollars per unit our cost because we change these out regularly a couple of years is eleven thousand dollars and we hire a contractor to do it mm -hmm. so there's a big difference in the some of the project costs we haven't checked all of them that's hard to do with you know 1500 light bulbs mm -hmm. okay yeah just provide us with the information if you would yes, all, the commi all the commissioners any other questions from the board commissioners no one more Okay. Yeah, we're at the end. And just but for the record, can we back to wrap up what, what I thought we we collectively as as the board at that time was to come up with a way to realize savings because we're always talking about the spend. We're gonna go back to my commentary. It was about the spend. We're always being judged by the public on the spend. And the whole <laughs> premise was well, let's find ways in which we can save money. Right, and this is this is big, big dollar, big, big HVACs. Right, we know that we've got to replace them. We know there needs to be consistency. And this one of those where I think we had some success with I guess the aquatic center. Um, Director Dukes and them did. I think I give them credit. And whoever was appropriate, they we began to change some light bulbs. So go back. To it. It's always good to look at history to understand so how how, how you leverage that. And, I, and I'm thinking of and back to Commissioner Mulcair's point, which is a good thought which is the capacity of our staff to be able to pull this off. Uh, what is the timing in which there, because again, the point is, if it's gonna take you 10 years to realize me my savings, and I'm just using that hypothetically for staff to be able to get in there versus, how long does it take to implement th this solution that they're proposing versus what our internal capabilities, can you match their implementation schedule? In other words, when can the Board of Commissioners be, be able to realize that savings? Right? It's all about, if we're talking about so sensitive about the general fund, and here's how we can sort of reduce savings because we don't have to spend this money on capital equipment because savings from this energy offsets it. Show me how you, how you can beat that implementation schedule. That means that by the time they implement this solution, we begin to get the yield, the annual yield that they're guaranteeing, how do you outperform that? So um, short answer is I can't. Uh, on, on the implementation schedule. What is their schedule? Uh, their schedule is one year, uh, less than a year, probably eight uh, months. Six, eight months, but um, we said it at all. On our end, um, what I had on the three year plan was uh, doing all the lighting in three years. Um, and when I said all the lighting, th that includes more than what's in the audit. So the audit covers around 80% of the lights. Um, it was it was full blown. Some of the numbers that I've come up with are a lot more. Um, so we can match the bulk of the lighting um, within the year. That's the that's your big savings up front. Um, HVAC, the rooftop units, their contract out. We could do that. I could do that within a month. That was installed. That's not a problem. Some of the things that are not included in the proposal of the county side doing it would be um, like replacing uh, toilets and things like that. So we don't have that capability to come in and do hundreds at a time. Um, but it's one of the low, long paybacks, so I didn't include it anyway. So um, on, on the things that pay back good, we could definitely do it in three years. Probably could do the bulk of everything in two years. Now on the flip side of that, their savings is you would start realizing the 180 some odd thousand at the end of the year. 
we would save seventy five thousand or seventy eight thousand the first year, and then it would bump up. If that's doing the bulk of lighting first year because that's your big savings, your quick payback. The HVAC items they actually they don't have a big savings. That's just an operational problem that we need to you know, solve. The savings are only around two hundred dollars per unit per year. So there's. And you answered the question about I think last time and I'm regarding and I'm going to yield this because we, this is sufficiently addressed. Um, there was also the purchasing power. So there's savings on one side, and then there's our volume purchasing. <laughs> Go back to what we're trying to think about here: solving loan. If we got stuff that we know we got to replace. Uh, we're, we're looking for a discipline that shows us how we can sort of spread this out over time. All right, we got some savings that are, are guaranteed <coughs> us. And so there was a bulk purchasing that was done, right, volume. If you're doing one-off, you don't get bulk purchasing. And Director Peacock can correct me if I said this wrong. But I get to do all this equipment at once or, or whatever, you know, whatever their little schedule is. Um, <coughs> but you're not, we're not funding, the Board of Commissioners are not funding it like that. See, the, the key thing is how we're going about funding this, right? There's, what's not being said is there's an ask that in essence that I know there's a financing component per se, but if you do it yourselves, that's a whole different budgeting process. That's directly out of the general fund, right? Is that right? That's correct. Okay. We're all setting this, right? This was, this was all about a financing solution, guys. Go back to my original. And again, so you got bulk purchasing on one side, they got volume that we know we're not going to buy 30 HVACs. No way. Right? Out the gate. Right, so you got the volume purchasing, which you should have brought it down, right? We get benefits there. We got volume savings on the back side. Like he said, we can realize on the front side. So again, I'm listening for our counter to, to Mr. Mm -hmm. Mulcair's point, mm -hmm. which is like I'm looking for the path forward. It says, how do you how do you outperform what they just put on the table? I'm <clears> still <throat> back to the jail is not involved in this, right? Correct. And these thirty odd other buildings or forty whatever that, that just they're miscellaneous. Doesn't matter, right? Correct. All right, so I'm trying to keep this solution that it doesn't become complex. You got 30 bills that were already identified that we've been looking at for a while. You got the jail that was separate that we know that we were supposed to come back to, and you got the rest of the buildings. One more time, you got a solution <coughs> for us, and that there's a plan that the, the staff can come up with. Uh, how do you solve the jail and everything else? I mean, I, for me, that's my goal forward because what I'm hearing is I, I don't, I hear the desire, but I'm, I'm looking for execution. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm looking for assured execution. If somebody's going to guarantee me a public company, this is not some, you know, this is a publicly traded company that's going to guarantee us this um, and, and help realize this versus staff that says, I think I can. I believe I can. There's some conditions. I get that. But let's separate the two and say, okay, bet, based on what you said and based on what you've learned through this exercise, do the rest of the buildings and the big jail. Think about it. Last point, the jail is what, 500,000 square feet? These buildings that we're talking about in this proposal is what, 600,000 square feet? That means half the savings that you might realize is in one single building that's not even on the table. Take that and the other 30 buildings, come up with a plan to, from the learning that you got from this and to help us realize better over time. I mean, that, 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 uh, that's, I'm looking for why not? Well, so the jail, that, that's off limits for me. I, I'm property management, and I have all the other buildings <laughs> other than this building you. and the jail. Okay, so, you get yeah. the jail. Can you unless get the jail? Unless <laughs> you, okay. you guys as a board say, I've got all access and I can do it, all then right, I'll look it. into that. But until then, I'm, I'm not going to go knocking on the door. <laughs> the, jail. Um, the other 30 buildings, sure, we can do that. Uh, that's, that's not an issue. We can look into it. It kind of goes back to what you're saying, the size. Those 30 buildings may equate to 5,000 square feet total, you know, where you're already talking about a million square feet. So, yes, there would be savings realized. Yes, we can do that. It's not going to be a significant savings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, James, also, just you and I realize that I know you're very familiar with the Six Sigma. I talked about that uh, probably at our last meeting. And the lean process that occurs throughout the United States with all buildings, uh, because that uh, that energy savings component has been critical in reducing uh, expenses in facilities. So I know we talked about 17 
HVAC systems that were possibly, you said they were new, uh, I guess they were in better condition than the other 40. I, just, I wanted to know why Amerisco chose those 17 versus the, the others that may have been older. Was it any method behind that particular maintenance? Can you speak to it? You want to say that? So I'll, I'll split it up. The 17 is 13 on the fire admin building. They're grouped together. Yeah, come on. Up here. Yeah. And then there was four at the ride share building. Okay. On, on our end, they are, those were from 2004 and 2002, I believe. Mm -hmm. So there are older than that and more least efficient as for why they were chosen. They were chosen based on um, the facilities personnel that actually maintain them on each site. So when we went to each site, we asked the people who occupied and worked on the buildings, what units are giving y'all the most problems currently? Mm -hmm. And so Chief Spencer mentioned, look, the rooftop units at the fire, at the fire admin headquarters are giving me problems. So we took a look at those at the ride share building where there was four older air handling units. The, the maintenance guy there said the same thing basically, like we're, we're having to order parts for these units all the time and replace them. And so obviously we would love to replace all the old, everything that's old, but with a performance contract, there's only so much savings that's generated. So we went for the items that according to personnel who were working on them, gave them the most difficulty and the most parts spent. Okay, so on uh, basically, Mechanical feedback. Yes. Like basic, yep. There okay. were older units, but if someone said no, they were fine. We we dropped them lower on our priority list. Were those compared to the other units that property management deals with on a day-to-day -day basis? Which other units? The all of the other all units. the other all units in the county. How, how compared? How so? I mean, compared on things going wrong with them. How much? How many problems we had with them? The same things you just talked oh, about, okay. why you put them on the list. So we never received any sort of detailed uh, maintenance expenditures, you know, on a per unit basis. So the only information we had to go on was what the maintenance personnel told us directly, which is, you know, yeah, these units are spending a lot of money on. So I can't quantify the difference because um, we never received like a ledger with the, you know, air handling unit two, we spent $2,000 on this past year. I never got any sort of information like that. I don't know if those records are kept. Um, it was all based on conversations with employees. We had requested it. I mean, it's an MMR report, basically, maintenance yeah. and repair report. <laughs> okay. Did we drill down on the the manufacturer of those 17 just to say they, they all are the kid on this, this, this um, determination? So the, the all the units at the fire department headquarters are, are trained, and Train, that is yes. what we have specified. But again, during if the contract is signed, we rebid it to other contractor. You know, we have a, a price based on an initial um, proposal. And just like any HVAC contract, they're generally only good for about 30 days. So once a contract is signed with the county, um, we would have to go back and rebid everything out. And if the county has any preferences on manufacturers, you know, let us know. Because um, we're vendor neutral. We don't, we don't care who we install. Personally, we've, we've had good luck in the past with train units. Um, they seem to last a long time. And so since you all already had it, we decided to spec a similar product. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want something else, by all means, let us know. You know, you can spec basically anything. Okay. Man, um, to add one more thing, you really may be able to talk to it a little bit more. What was spec okay, was, could you come I'm to sorry. The microphone? Um, okay. What was spec, by the way, as far as, you know, there's going to be a difference in pricing, of course. One big part of it, which could be as much as 25% of the differential, is uh, the efficiency that was spec mm -hmm. for it. So the current units are all standard efficiency. Um, the proposed units are about 20% more efficient, which also carries a 20% premium in price. Um, you, it, they're considered high efficiency, um, and so even though the, the payback is you know is over 100 years on say the um, the rooftop units, one of the reasons is that is because. <coughs> With the new control systems we're proposing to install, the run hours will also be reduced. So it's sort of like a, once you go from a, a you know fluorescent to a, an LED lamp, um, you're already using so little energy um, that it, the interactive effects of some of the measures, it might not make sense to put the light controls on it because they're already efficient enough. And so with the building controls, you're already turning off all your units at night. And so yes, you're having efficiency gain during the day, but you're already minimizing the amount that you're using your units um, that the efficiency that the overall payback appears to be longer 
Mm -hmm. that, I'm probably going to explain that back later. But yeah, that, it has a favorable sure. effect on your life expectancy. That's that too, yeah. The less you use it, I mean, assuming routine maintenance, the longer it will last. Yep. Which we did not, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> we focused on the um, energy um, savings here because we're directed to stay mm -hmm. with that um, and did not include, include the all in savings that would be. I mean, I, new stuff doesn't break down. You're going to save money that way, but we didn't want to buy it that way because we were asked. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? All right. Thank you all so much for the presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? <coughs> Today we have a planning and zoning board of uh, appointment, and that will be discussed in our executive uh, session. Ooh, my attorney stepped out. I was going to ask him at this time. Do we have anything else? Yes, we have personnel and litigation. Okay. All right. I'm waiting on the attorney to step back in so I can call the executive session. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We need an executive session to leave. Yes. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Yes. Okay. All in favor? Say aye. Can I give a second? Did you say executive session? Did you say executive session? I gave a second. All in favor? Say aye. He comes out with this. Yes. 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 Um, thank you for participating in county government, and if there are no other questions or concerns from the Board of Commissioners, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>